Can everyone see that? All right, cool. Um, whenever you're good to go, Jacob, you can start. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Pack Bionics. Um, so this is our interest meeting to just give you um, a look at what we do, what we've done in the past, um, and uh, our plans for this year. Uh, can you go to the next slide? <laughs> I'm gonna be saying that a lot. Um, so this is our executive branch. Alex, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hey guys, I'm Alex, as Jacob was saying. I'm a senior in biomedical engineering with a minor in comp sci. Um, and I've been a part of this club for about four years um but yeah uh, and i'm jacob i'm a junior in biomedical engineering i joined the club last year uh, and then we also have michael he's our treasurer um so he was in bme and now he's doing a like a uh, master's in electrical engineering and then we have jason uh as our secretary and he's doing a dual um major in biomedical engineering and uh computer science and he's actually from unc uh so he makes the commute for uh our meetings every week yeah uh, we actually have like a few people from unc um that are also part of bme so uh so we've partnered with some faculty members in bme uh, and they've given us personalized lectures, uh, explain their research, and they've helped us uh, brainstorm some of our ideas. Um, so one of those is Dr. Huang. Uh, she's the director for the Neuromuscular Rehabilitation Engineering Lab. Uh, and, she, and she works on uh, hands, exoskeletons, and legs. Uh, and their leg that you can see in the top right, that's a picture of it, um, works similar to uh, our end goal design. Um, so we met with them last week, actually, and we got to see the leg um, in their lab, and they showed us like the control systems that they were using. And we plan to work more with them in the future. Um, we we don't exactly know uh, how much freedom we'll we'll get to have with um, uh, using their equipment. So that's uh, yet to be found out. Uh, and then we also. I've been working with Dr. Sharma. He teaches uh, biomedical mechanics um, and researches nonlinear control systems. Um, and he's actually going to be giving us a lecture on nonlinear non controls uh, in October. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we have we have two more. We have uh, Dr. Wigan and then also Dr. Camper. Yeah. So uh, we also have access to Sharma's lectures on nonlinear controls in general. So like beyond uh, the uh, beyond the one lecture he's going to give us uh, in person, I guess that's more personalized. Um, we can also just learn more on our own. Um, and then for Dr. Wigan, um, he does a lot of mechanical design himself. Um, he actually helped us a lot with the first iteration of her leg, which we'll show later. Um, and he's well, he's the current senior design professor, so he has a lot of industry experience and connections as well. Um, and Dr. Camper, he does a lot of uh, rehabilitation engineering um, related to hand prosthetics, uh, but he acts more as like our like club advisor more than anything, um, rather than like research experience. But he's definitely a good resource for just getting contacts and and whatnot. Okay, so there's a large there's a large population of uh, lower limb amputees in the United States. Um, it's definitely larger than I expected, um, and so this obviously greatly affects people. Uh, so that's our primary motivation. <laughs> um, so here is kind of the development of legs. So um, prosthetic legs have been around for centuries, starting from the peg leg. Um, to these mechanical um, designs, um, and then finally to these modern designs. And more recently, um, people have been trying to put electronics into legs um, to uh, further mimic the natural gait cycle. Um, and that's what our club aims to do. So we're designing a transfemoral prosthetic leg, um, which means that it's the upper leg, the lower leg, and then the knee joint. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to go in there. And, to uh, building the control systems to make it um, 
predict leg motion. So we also compete, uh, our, our primary goal, I guess, is to compete in Cybathlon. Uh, so that, that happens every four years um, in Switzerland. Um, and it's a competition where um, companies and research groups uh, and clubs like us can come and uh, tackle problems in prosthetics and rehabilitation engineering. So they have an exoskeleton race they have a powered arm race, um, a powered leg race, which we are competing in, and a powered uh, wheelchair race and a couple more. Um, and we narrowed our focus to just the powered leg. And it's a four minute time race. And so you basically can uh, complete everyday activities like um, standing up, jumping over hurdles, uh, balancing, uh, and walking up ramps and stairs. And this is just a video um, showcasing the competition. Yeah, so um, I'll just go a little bit into the history of our club um, and give you a little bit more background on who we are. Um, so our club actually sprung out of another, uh, I guess it was a larger club before, um, called Biomedical Devices Club. Um, they're no longer around um, just because uh, their, their exec board kind of fell apart, to be honest. Uh, but our team, who was part of that club, wanted to keep doing this. And so we kind of sort of subsumed them. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, since then, we've been able to get our own RB, our own lab space, and uh, pretty pretty good funding. We have around uh, 9K, 8.5K um, of funding right now. And we're looking for other funding sources at the moment. Um, so. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, uh, our primary purpose is to compete for the Cybathlon competition, um, which actually started in 2016. So those videos that you saw was from 2016. Um, and the most recent one was in 2020. Um, for us, unfortunately, we weren't really able to compete because of the pandemic um, and then other just uh, logistical issues uh, for our team. Um, but yeah, so on the picture on the right, you can actually see the first iteration of our leg, um, it's just a dual cam sort of design. You can see here on the bottom, um, it's cable driven and then uh, passively retracts with the springs on the back. Um, but yeah. So this is just a video of us uh, sort of assembling the, the leg. Um, just thought it'd be interesting for you guys to see. Uh, this is pre-pandemic time so yeah um so our present goal so um the first iteration of relog actually had quite a few um design flaws um, and also it was pretty hard to manage um, and actually uh, create like a linear model for, uh, for controls purposes, just because of the unique cam shapes. And then the fact that it was uh, cable driven um, made that more difficult. So uh, for the new, for, for the current club, our goals are to redesign the leg. Um, and you can start to see some very, very early concepts here on the right. Um, a four bar mechanism, which mimics um, natural knee movement. Um, but yeah, so this would, you know, remove the cable driven design, which um, prevents the chance from them snapping, which was sort of one of the problems we had in the other design. Um, of course, that can be solved through other design mechanisms as well. Um, 
but this also allows us to have a better uh, control system as well. Um, and we're, we're starting over with the control system too. Um, first, learning with some of our partner faculty, for example, Dr. Huang, who we mentioned earlier, um, we plan on working closely with her to hopefully get more of an idea how to drive prosthetic legs um, through more conventional methods. Um, yeah, uh, and so hopefully this partnership will help you guys learn more. Um, and we're definitely still in the process of learning that too. But yeah. So uh, for a mechanical mechanism, like I said, uh, it's that four bar mechanism. You can sort of see the trajectory um, of the center of that four bar um, as it bends. Um, and like I said, it mimics natural knee movement, um, just as the fact that knees don't bend around a single point of rotation, um, whereas a lot of current prosthetics do. Uh, so it creates a more unnatural gait cycle, which can cause more pain to the amputee. Um, we're doing a direct drive system here. Uh, of course, that's up for, um, for change, uh, depending on opinions from anyone. Um, and right now we are focusing on primarily the knee joint, um, just for making this project a little bit easier. Uh, however, we are open to working on the ankle joint later as well, um, to sort of further help that natural gait movement. Um, of course, that makes it more complicated um, and a bit heavier, more power requirements, et cetera. But it's definitely possible. So on the control side, so Jacob gave you an overview of the obstacle course, and we need to be able to traverse all of these. And so there's quite a few obstacles uh, in here, and they're all meant to trip you up in, in some sort of way. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a competition. Um, so yeah. so. Uh, you can sort of just see the, um, the obstacles on the on the left, and then sort of a diagram of it here. And the main challenging ones, I'd say, are definitely um, sit to stand, and then uh, the balance beam, as well as uh, the stairs. Uh, and the stairs is super important because basically creates the requirement that we have to use a powered prosthetic, otherwise, um, the amputee wouldn't be able to climb the stairs. Um, so on the control side, uh, sort of mentioned this before, we want to use more conventional uh, control methods. So having sort of uh, preset angles um, for each state of the gait cycle or, or um, whatever type of walking they're doing, whether upstairs or if they're just sitting, sitting to standing, and then just tuning those parameters um, through various methods. So uh, either trial and error or working with expert prosthetics. Uh, prosthetist, um, or even possibly doing some uh, machine learning in the future to sort of um, tune, more finely tune those parameters, um, which is something that Dr. Huang's lab has done before. Um, so that might not happen for quite a bit, uh, but it's another possible path. Um, so for the control side, we, we sort of done a little bit of expo early exploration as well. Um, so some ideas were, uh, you know, take various sensor information. So like I, IMUs or uh, load cell uh, data to that measures force and moment. Um, and then sort of predict at what angle the knee should be at and drive the motor to that angle. Um, and so I think this is probably some early neural network prediction stuff that we did. Um, of course, with more irregular data beyond just walking, this becomes a lot more complicated. And uh, the model definitely does not work as well in that case. But here's just some early stuff um, to get you guys thinking about various ideas. Um, so. Uh, something that's not really been explored too much is nonlinear control. Um, so that's why we're working with Dr. Sharma. Um, and so walking is inherently a nonlinear sort of controls problem uh, just because humans walk at irregular paces and change their paces and you don't really know what they're going to do. They change terrain, et cetera. Um, 
So there's really no period periodicity in this. Um, so this is definitely a area we look to explore, uh, especially with Dr. Sharma. Um, and we're also working on some other projects, uh, like smaller mini projects just for learning purposes. Um, so this is one here, it's an uh, inverted pendulum. Um, yeah. So this is a simulation that we made and uh, just simulated um, for you guys to see. But yeah, uh, so hopefully the goal is to get to something like this, uh, but you know, the leg portion, that'd be really cool. <laughs> um, but of course, we're a few years from that point. Uh, more on the software side of things. So um, I'll start with the diagram on the right here. So this is sort of the overall um, very, very, very high level abstract view of the software. So we have um, the actual human prosthetic system um, and its dynamics and all of that, and sort of reading those system states through uh, various sensors. So cameras uh, or IMUs or encoders or load cells, et cetera, processing those, um, getting a state estimation. So figuring out whether we should be, uh, well, whether we know the amputee is walking up the stairs or is on a balance beam, et cetera. Um, and then planning what motions the amputee should be having and then moving the motor accordingly and providing the correct torques for those. Um, so we sort of plan on implementing all of this on um, ROS2, uh, specifically the Foxy variant. Um, and uh, so we can sort of organize those in, in nodes um, and then pass those through uh, what we call topics. Um, and then we want to deploy this on the Jetson Nano for now, um, just because it's pretty good base computer for um, for ROS as well as uh, it's open to other machine learning stuff like TensorFlow or PyTorch for possible future development. Um, of course, in the long run, uh, way down the road, we might swap to a smaller type of computer or even microcontrollers if, if possible. Um, but for development purposes, we're going to stay um, on an easier to use device. So yeah, so these are sort of the tech clusters within um, the club itself. So um, if you're interested in one of these areas, we have the hardware design. So you're going to be doing a lot of mechanical design through SOLIDWORKS. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of product development research, um, 3D printing, um, PCB design through Altium or Eagle or whatever your choice of PCB software is. Um, and we can also help teach you these things. Um, and then also working with like embedded systems and that sort of programming. Uh, and then on the software side, uh, so uh, honestly, any software experience is really nice to, to learn. Um, so uh, you'll get experience in MATLAB and Simulink, which is using a lot of controls situation uh, problems. Um, Python uh, and then PyTorch and TensorFlow for machine learning, uh, as well as just you can use it on ROS or whatever. Um, C, C++ for embedded systems, also ROS. Um, and then uh, GitHub for uh, just version control of software. Um, that's sort of how we'll implement that. And then uh, because we are using a Jetson Nano and with the possibility of moving to other computers, we also want to implement um, containerization, which is basically packaging software into its own environment to make sure that it's compatible between different computers, different hardware. Um, and like I said, embedded programming, uh, and then Edge AI, which is more specific to Jetson Nano. On the control side, um, sort of break it down into three main areas, linear control. Um, so PID controls, sort of the most well-known, easiest thing. There's state space models, which is somewhat related, um, and root locus analysis as well. Um, Nonlinear control, so reinforcement learning. That'll involve a little bit closer to, to the neural networks machine learning side. Um, and then like optimal control, and then actual machine learning. So neural networks, computer vision uh, is definitely down the road. But yeah. Um, 
So if you guys are still interested uh, and want to join the club, like uh, scan this QR code and fill out the Google Forms. We'd love to know more about your experiences, your interests, um, your time commitments. Um, and uh, we currently meet two days a week. Uh, depending on how many people join, we may change this up. I know there are quite a few people that said they couldn't make it because of classes at this time. So times may change as well. You're also welcome to join our Discord here. There should be a link to that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, if anyone has questions, you're welcome to ask. Hello, uh, my name is Jasmine Schaefer. Uh, I do have a question. I, I know that you guys were talking about a lot of future projects um, and kind of a lot down the road, but have you guys ever considered actually putting into um, actual uh, neural sensors? Uh, like I'm talking along the lines of um, like sensing EMGs. neurological. Um, I'm new to uh, terminology, so. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming that you're talking about actually. Yeah, like muscle actually, stimulation like, kind of stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about actually on the uh, nervous system, like working with specifically the nervous system and having a, a prosthetic that mimics uh, neurological um, signals. Yeah, yeah. So actually, we have thought about that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the rules for the Cybathlon competition themselves prohibit that we have like any electronics or anything touching the amputee, um, which basically means that this thing has to be like a completely separate system, which sucks, uh, to be honest, because oh. I, I think that would be really exciting research as well um, and would definitely add to the control scheme in terms of making it better. Um, but uh, we could do that on the side right, thank as you. separate, but yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I just wanted to see where it would go if I did get into it. It's still a whole lot of information and uh, I, I love the, this idea. So I, I'm looking forward in the last, so thank you. Yep, no problem. So like, I know that this is like a four year sort of plan. So is there like any side projects or like any like local events that we do or do we do any outreach stuff like that? Uh, what do you mean by like outreach stuff? I guess. Um, I'm coming here from a first background. Okay. Um, not really too much outreach, but like in terms of like side projects, like I said, we'll be working with Dr. Huang's lab, um, and hopefully be able to, you know, learn a bit more controls and hopefully work with some of her prosthetic legs see how our controls compares to what they develop. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of it. I don't I don't really have anything like, I guess, super related to first. Um, uh, no, it's fine. But thank you. I mean, if you if you have ideas as well, we're open to to those as well. So. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions? There's a few questions in the chat. Oh. Could you post the presentation to the link? Uh, so I will, uh, actually, yeah, I will. Um, so how many hours uh, do you expect each member to put in? So um, I'd say I, I would want at least people to put in um, about four hours a week would be great. So if you can't make them, if you can't make both meetings, that's fine. Um, and like I said, that might change anyways. Uh, but just doing some work outside or would be great as well. Um, how much experience are you expecting from each member? Um, we're not really requiring any experience. Any that you have is great. Uh, but I will say the purpose of this club is mainly for learning. Um, yeah. Um, Back to the hours question, that being said, uh, the more time you put in, the more you'll get out of this as well, uh, sort of relating to the purpose of learning. If you don't put in the hours, you're not gonna learn as much. Um, yeah. 
Uh... Yeah. Any any other questions? I don't know if I missed this, but are you guys uh, having a, I mean, I see your meeting space, but are you also doing all your constructing in that very room? Um, yes, for the most part, but we also um, have uh, contacts outside for manufacturing um, like mechanical parts. Um, so la last time we actually sent our parts over to China through a contact that we had um to be made and then um but we also have like a uh machine shop that's also an eb3 that we have access to you just have to complete training for that so the main machine shop being for like metal work but or are you talking about the um 3d printers the maker space oh so we have three 3d printers in our actual space an actual lab as well uh and we have okay. i mean we have quite a bit, uh, few tools you know soldering irons um presses uh oscilloscopes function generators power supplies etc okay so for the most part we'll be able to stay within that same building thank you yeah um actually jacob since you're there if you want uh you can give them a really quick tour of the lab space <laughs> i guess so um I guess I'll just walk over there. Yeah, just walk uh, and over. Someone, someone asked, is the competition uh, annual? So it's every four years, uh, kind of like the Olympics. Um, and so, and then someone else asked uh, how we performed in the last competitions. So we've actually never competed because it got canceled last year because of COVID. And before then, the club hadn't even been founded. Well, so correction on that last point. It it wasn't canceled, but because of COVID, they went online and like logistics were really, really messy. Um, and then like also like we had a few design flaws in our leg that we couldn't really account for last minute. Um, so yeah, also our motor burned out, which was very unfortunate. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'll stop sharing for now so that you guys can 